you guys for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And um, for all the lists of groups that I am part of or have volunteered for in the past that Michael didn't read, and that's really good. Uh, Rotary is not one of them. So it was actually very nice to be able to sit here and, and learn a little bit more about all the things that you guys do because you're doing a lot of stuff and that's really great. I know that because I have been involved with the city for so long, I know that we have partnered with the Rotary and other service groups in, throughout the city. And um, the work that is being done on the Miracle League right now at the community center, uh, yeah, the community center at Lucchese Park is absolutely wonderful and you guys should really be very proud of yourself as you know because you've been doing this these are not the things that happen overnight they take a lot of planning they take a lot of coordinating they take a lot of money raising and that is not easy um, but when you have a community like petaluma that is very very much a community of people with their hands out and their sleeves rolled up saying what can we do to help I think that really does help. And being on the city side of this equation in our town, if we did not have these volunteer groups, these service groups, and the nonprofits in our town, we would get nothing done in this town. So thank you all for all that you do here. And I know many of you are involved in many other organizations, so I really do appreciate that. So. Um, I am only going to very briefly give an outline of what is going on right now or the state of the city as we find ourselves now um, because I have just started as the mayor but I am continuing over from 12 years as a council member uh, but uh, I, I would actually prefer to actually have questions from you if you have concerns about what, you, what interests you or what you want to know more about. I think that that's more helpful because uh, I think a lot of people always think they know what's happening, but it's what we hear from the other from people in our community that really lets us know what's on your mind, and that's what's really important. Um, being being elected the mayor, I think we all know here that the mayor is a weak mayor in Petaluma. We're not talking Michael Bloomberg here, or Gavin Newsom when he was the mayor, or Willie Brown. You know, we're talking one of seven who actually gets to run the meetings and does a little bit more coordination with the city manager and the city attorney. So it, it is, it is a, a slightly elevated position, but really I am one among equals. And, and that's the way I work best. I work best in collaboration with other people. And I think that's really the only way to make a sustainable change because if you're not working together with people when you leave the whole thing falls apart and I think um, we do have some examples of great ideas that once the engine was gone you know the, the, the train is no longer moving so we don't want to see that going forward we want to see things in Petaluma meeting the needs of who's here now and who needs to be here in order to keep the city going um, and that we all, I believe you all know that we're getting a new city manager, uh, Peggy Flynn, who is not quite a resident of Petaluma, but we're extending um, to her residency. She lives out on Spring Hill Road. And I, um, we, we do always want the city manager to live in Petaluma, but we think that's close enough. Uh, she will be starting on the 25th of February, and I think she has a lot of work ahead of her. Our main concerns going ahead are the same they have been since 2008, and that is funding revenue. And we are going to have to look at this very seriously and creatively, and we're going to have to have the entire community on board with us. We are not in as bad a shape as some communities. I just heard that Santa Rosa is like $15 million in the red. They are going to have to figure this out for this, this funding cycle coming forward in July. Uh, we aren't there for a year or so, uh, but we're, we're headed there. And um, it's just a structural issue. It's nothing that I think the city is doing incorrectly. 
I think that under the leadership of John Brown, who I strongly admire his fiscal ability and his uh, acumen in that area, he was really able to make us move forward with the least amount of money that um, we could do it on. And, but that's no longer sustainable. It really hasn't been sustainable, but we have been able to go forward. But we have a tremendous uh, attrition in our police force, not because the police don't enjoy working here, but because they can get more money working somewhere else. So we're able to acquire police, we're able to train police, we're able to get them through probation, and then they go somewhere else where they can make more money. It's, you know, it's uh, unfortunate, but it is the way it is, and we need to uh, increase our, our pay for police, and we also need to increase the number of police we have. Having said that, I think it's very important to realize that we do not have an increased crime problem in this city. We get monthly reports from each department, and crime continues to drop in this city, which is only an indication of what a good community this is, and how good the police are in their outreach. So I think that those things are great, but we can't count on that. We can't really count on that continuing, and we do need to bring the level of service up so that we can grow as a community uh, and our police services can as well. Um, we have other services, our park, parks need more work and, and we are actually going to be getting money from Measure M. So thank you to everybody who supported that throughout the county. But Petaluma is getting a, a nice, um, I think it's over $75,000 a year that we'll be getting from that measure for the next 10 years. And that is really going to be very helpful. The fact that Measure 6, uh, the statewide uh, proposition, uh, was defeated is also a good for Petaluma because we will getting, be getting more money back in than we are paying in gas taxes, and that will help us with our road and street maintenance. In fact, it is pretty much our road and street maintenance because that is also a pot that has been pretty empty and has not been sufficient to take care of what our needs are. But I think if you have driven around Petaluma in the last six to eight months, you've seen that Caulfield was repaved, you've seen that 6th Street and 4th Street were repaved, Magnolia was repaved. We've had a lot of work done and that's all been Proposition 6 money. So that, that's really been very helpful for us. So we do have some pots of money that are coming to us but we do need to actually raise revenues, and that, that is going to be, I think, the main thing we're doing for the foreseeable two years. I think that will be on the ballot in 2020. Uh, but between now and then, even while we're raising money and consciousness and hopefully support to pa pass that effort, uh, we do have goals that we are going to be setting once our new city manager is here and that list will be longer than I am tall because everybody has something that they need to get done and um, you know again those are those are it's very difficult to be doing everything because you don't have a lot of resources in the city and that's where we're going to be looking for our partnerships to to make that happen um, the main issues that are in front of us right now that are very controversial in the city, I guess there's two that everybody knows about. One is the Safeway gas station, and that um, is in a situation where it's going to be coming back to us uh, to, to determine whether we're gonna go forward with that or not. And the other one is the bathtub art. And um, I think these things couldn't be more different um, I think one of them is, is a particularly serious um, development that is going to be right next to a school and child care and a, the Little League uh, athletic field and is probably unavoidable. I, I, I don't want to say for certain because things in this area just keep changing, uh, but it will have a big, huge impact on our traffic, uh, circulation, uh, and, that, and the people who live in that neighborhood and the people whose children are in those schools and daycare. Uh, the, the art 
uh, is another issue that while I um, have been quoted as saying no one is going to go hungry if that goes up and no one's going to go hungry if it doesn't go up, it still seems to be a very, very um, touchy uh, issue with a lot of people. And um, so whatever we, however we decide to solve that problem, we're going to leave a lot of people unhappy. Either, either way it goes. It just is not going to please everybody. But I think that is something over which we can't, you know, we can't get over that one. And, um, you know, we're just going to move forward on that. But anyhow, um, I would like to hear from you if you guys have any questions or concerns. I actually forget how much time you've been uh, given me, so um, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't want to take up too much time. Fifteen minutes is fine, yes. Okay, so if anybody does have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'll be happy to answer or ask the first one. Well, you can answer them too. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll just make it quick. You mentioned about um, revenue, which I think is a great way to help solve the problem. Dan LaBarro, when he was talking to John Brown, you know, how much is unfunded in pension, $95 million or whatever the number was, was staggering. But I'm wondering, you know, one way obviously is taxation, the other is you know, have more businesses like our cities north and south. Do you see as kind of be kind of some of each, or do you have any visions in terms of where our revenues might come from? So I'm not sure what you say when you are like what what cities are you pointing at that have more uh, revenue? Novato or Roanoke Park. You know, they seem like you know when a lot of people go shopping. You know, we've got the Target Shopping Center. That was a great step. We have Freedmans. But we still, um, a lot of people go to other cities. And you know, one factor, I suppose, is we have a lot of traffic, is maybe if we have more businesses. But you know, we used to have the Telecom Valley. and So I guess just your thoughts in terms of where revenue might possibly be coming from. Well, I think revenue, the kind of revenue that we're looking for is some kind of taxation. And exactly what kind of taxation is what's going to have to be d determined. Sales tax, I think, um, I, I don't know if anyone here is so deep in the weeds that you are aware of the CASA compact, but I did see that JT Wick is going to be one of your speakers in about a month, so if you don't know it now, you will know it then. Um, CASA compact is a housing program that has been put forward by the nine Bay Area counties and actually may spill over into something more statewide, but it is going to need legal legislative changes in order to put uh, in place. And it is extremely controversial in some of the areas because of a one-size-fits-all kind of template that it is proposing. It is an, an attempt to provide housing in a way that the Bay Area has not been providing housing and that means at all levels of need. And part of that is going, it, it's very complicated. It's got at least 10 different elements to it, which include things like rent control and uh, just cause eviction. It includes streamlining uh, design and uh, land use issues. It also includes asking for an inventory of all publicly owned land. Uh, so that the state can determine whether it's being used to its highest and best use, which, you know, I'm just, my antenna go up on that. Uh, I'm thinking that the, the concerns that the uh, city council and the fair board have been working out or attempting to work out on the our fair lease, you know, that may be totally usurped by the state saying, oh, well, actually, you know, that, that's really the land where housing should go. I really think we need some local control over that. And it, uh, but on the other hand, I know we need to have low income and affordable housing so that people who actually work here can live here. And that businesses that work here can have people who work here live here. And so it is a very, very fine ballet that needs to be done. And we need to do it very carefully and make sure that our interests are protected as well as trying to, to fill that, that need. And, and that is something that I'm going to work on. So I know this is kind of a long and rambling response to that, 
But I do think, I, I, I always want to be honest, uh, and I like the little quote that was given this morning, you know, that you, if you start telling lies, you're not going to remember that, so just be honest with people. We're talking revenue increase. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate truth of um, taxation, well, there's two from sales tax. Well, property tax, first of all, Petaluma gets like 13 cents on the dollar in property tax. So that's, that's difficult, so we need to really work with that. The other thing is that sales tax, uh, part of this cost of compact will be to bring the sales tax revenue to the, to the site of the buyer, the consumer, rather than the distribution center. So right now, we don't get any sales tax from, tax from online sales. That can change, and it needs to change, because you know, building some retail will bring people, but it's not the retail where the big dollars are being spent, uh, you know, except for cars, and we do have an auto mall, and that's good. In fact, that is our retail uh, engine in this town. Uh, but if we're not getting, you know, it's online sales that are depleting the sales tax, not not the fact that we don't, we just put in 700 square, thousand square feet of retail. If there were retail that was going to be viable, it has a lot of places to go in this town. What we need to do is be very careful about making sure those retail dollars, tax dollars, come back here. Mm -hmm. That's the key there. So. Thank you. I might have forgotten my question, sorry. <laughs> um, during the political season this year, I went and spoke. One of our city council people who was reelected um, was speaking and said that the gas tax was most important that we don't repeal it because apparently sitting is a check that's sort of slated towards Rainier. It's supposed to be about 86,000, 86 million, or you, you must know this. It has some type of funding that goes towards the Rainier project, mainly on the other side of the highway, but then it was supposed to have already been sitting there for that project to begin if the sales tax, gas tax wasn't repealed. Okay, so the, there's two parts of funding for that to okay. answer that question. Uh, one is the gas tax that we need and that will continue, that will allow us, the state of California, Caltrans, to complete the widening of 101. And once, you know, don't get me started on why Petaluma is the last place that this was widened, uh, but it is and we need it done. But that will not be done until the end of 22, 2022. Okay. Okay, well, so, so that, that is part of the money that will be used uh, for that. But the real source of money was uh, Regional Measure 3, which was in a previous election, and that did pass. And that is the money that will get 101 completed. Once 101 is completed, it will be raised through Petaluma in such a way so that the underpass that can be the Rainier Crosstown Connector will exist. So basically, the tunnel or the donut hole will be there so that when the money is available for that, it can happen. Without the, without the freeway being raised, it cannot happen, and until the freeway is raised. But there, none of the money in Proposition 6 or in Regional Measure 3 includes any money for Rainier. There is no additional money being raised for Rainier other than the money that is, has been set aside, which is about $22 million. It is estimated to be at least $80 million, and that money is something we need to talk about if we're going to talk about building Rainier. I think the biggest thing for our community is our air quality because it's been a proven fact that when you have bumper to bumper traffic everywhere, you have carbon dioxide, and we really got to have it be one of our biggest agendas here between the road back and other things, and just the way it all becomes a traffic jam. Um, I'm, I'm just hoping that politicians and citizens and everybody that we all get together and try to do something about it. Fifty-seven percent of the greenhouse gases in Sonoma County are from tailpipes. And that is absolutely essentially needs to be uh, addressed and soon. 
So um, can you just confirm that the bathtub art has been approved by the council? No, no, I no. can't affirm that, and I can't it's deny that, because it has, I mean, I can deny that. It has not happened. It will be going to the public art committee at the end of this month for their regular meeting, and that is, I believe, the fourth Thursday of February. That is where that decision will be made. I am not a betting person, but I would put dollars to donuts that we are going to see an appeal of that whichever way the decision goes. Uh, and it will come to the council and the council will end up making the final decision on that. But, but that's not the process that's in hand. I, I'd like to ask a follow-on question to that, but it's not my main question. So, um, is, is it true that the award to the artist was made prior to knowing what he was going to build? It, it was an artist, you, you, same as with David Best. It, you give the artist an award based on their body of work, and you talk about what you want to see, and you know there were public meetings at the site where people discussed what they wanted to see, and then he went forth and was creative, and that's when everybody got involved. <laughs> I, I, I think it would be better promoted if you put some shower heads above the bathtubs to get some use out of them. Um, I'll pass that on. <laughs> my real question is, um, I, I don't live in town, but I engage with a lot of people in town in discussions, and some of them keep saying that the biggest problem with the budget of Petaluma is that there's so much uh, uh, employee benefits for retirees, etc., that, that uh, uh, soaks up a huge part of the actual budget for the city. Is that true? If so, what's the percentage? Well, I, okay, I don't know the actual percentage, but I do know two things, well, three things. One is um, we want a community where people can live that work here, and we also want a, people, uh, a community where people can retire. And uh, I have no problem with retirement benefits that are uh, supportable. And I believe that Petaluma has been primarily very responsible in their packages that they have contracted with and negotiated with our union employees. Um, and I, I know that because I know what other cities are facing and uh, other cities had 3% and retirement at 50, per, 50 years. Uh, we've never had that, you know, and, and now what we have had, we have scaled back on for current employees. But we do have a uh, promised and a contractual obligation to provide what we had agreed upon for those people who have retired. And that is a very large part of what we do owe. And I am not one for reneging on the promise. So um, if people think that is too rich and that seems to have to be the attitude now, we have corrected that going forward. But that correction doesn't take place until those people retire. And you know, I don't want to be too uh, blunt about it, but until older people die. Um, so not being in favor of any of those things, uh, you know, we are where we are, and we're you know, going forward with it. Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa have been, are in much worse shapes than we are. Then um, you know, we, we were frugal to start with, and, and we continue to be that, but we do have people who have retired and want to live here. Now, I know other uh, jurisdictions uh, outside the state of California in particular have a tax on uh, retirees who leave the area. Or, you know, and so if you are no longer going to be in California, maybe you have to pay a higher tax because you're no longer uh, contributing to our community. Maybe we could think about something like that. I think that would have to be statewide. But until then, you know, we do have that, and uh, that is true. But um, and, and it is our first obligation going forward. That's it. Uh, one quick question. Uh, I want to go back to the oh, revenue. You are. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to see where that voice is coming from. Yeah. Just I'm from all over. Well, uh, one more question going back to the revenue. 
you mentioned uh, Peru is in a state where we have to increase revenue. Totally understandable. But you came up with the best way to do that is to increase taxes. There's got to be some other out-of-box method that we could do that. I mean, you're going to put that on the ballot, and everyone's probably going to vote against it because no one wants to pay more taxes. So what is plan B other than taxes? Plan B will probably be writing up lists of people we'll be laying off. To be really honest about that, but that's um, that's well, not, that's not know, sustainable. No, it isn't sustainable. But uh, you know, neither it, you can't provide the services to the city without uh, a, a revenue source, and it's going to be our job to get out and talk to people like this about why that is essential. And you know, this is this is uh, perhaps the the prequel to that uh, effort. But you know uh, how that tax goes forward, I don't know. I, I've been talking to people in other jurisdictions. I'm the chair of a very uh, um, underknown group called LAFCO, which is an anti-sprawl commission for the state of, of the county of Sonoma. And every, just about every county has one except San Francisco, because there's nowhere for them to sprawl. Uh, but, you know, we just have been talking to fire districts that are coming together and merging because they can no longer exist as individual fire districts because of the expenses. One of those fire districts, which is going to be the one that all the, uh, there's three other fire districts, Bennett Valley and uh, Rincon Valley and Windsor are all going to be merging together and they're uh, going to merge under Windsor and then they're gonna call themselves the Sonoma County Fire Prevention District. They have a uh, parcel tax that uh, is approximately $180 a year per person. Uh, not per person, per, per parcel. And, uh, but, it isn't, but it isn't actually that. It, you know, that's what it averages out to, but vacant property gets taxed at a different level than developed property. Commercial property is, is taxed at a different level than um, single family homes, multi-use. There's a very different tax rate for these different parcels. And you know, it is something that we might want to look at for, for what we do here because it might be a little fairer than just saying, okay, everybody has to pay more sales tax or everybody pays a parcel tax no matter if you live in you know, the 13,000 square foot home or the 1,000 square foot home. Uh, but but I, I uh, you know, if you have an idea outside the box, I would love to hear it. I'm sure I'll come up with a few ideas. I mean, good, good. Come. Well, you mentioned about give me city your home. card. I, I will give you my card number and stuff. But uh, just real quick, uh, you mentioned about county-owned properties. They're just sitting there doing nothing. I mean, that's a huge way you can increase revenues. Um, the biggest property we have, center of town, is uh, the fairgrounds. It could be you still use as the fairgrounds, but that could be a huge convention center. I mm -hmm. mean, go to the developer; they build a huge hotel there where they could have the you know wine tasting, cheese, uh, you know, the, the creameries do stuff, uh, get people in town. Those are huge revenue sources. That's uh, just one idea. Add plenty more. I, I can almost say without a doubt that there is no convention center in the state of California that is not subsidized I'm by, not saying by taxpayers. No, no, no. Go private. Yeah, that, that's, I'm staple, you know, the it. Staples Center in LA, you know, the, none of those um, centers are actually not being, they're not run on the profit motive only. They have city subsidies. They are taxpayer underwritten. And it's very, very difficult to make those kinds of organizations operate in the black. Yeah, I'm just saying that. And this is probably not the, you know, the, the best venue for this kind of a conversation. But you know, it has been looked at. But it's not off the table. If there is a model for that, I'm certainly willing to look at that. Thank you. Well, Teresa, thank you for all the time that you give to the community over all the years. And I think I've got a solution.
Now that you no longer just a council person, you get don't you get double the salary? Is it ten dollars for every meeting you attend? You, you know, my first uh, paycheck came and it didn't have that, and I oh. said, hey, oh. I, was, yeah, I was counting on it. Well, I was thinking we could trim it and save some money, but I thank you for all that you do. Okay, and I have something for you. This is for the speaker for the speakers, the speaker, the speaker with the pedal marine. So thank you so much for everything. Okay, all thanks for coming. I hope you have a good week and do all good things in Have a great day. Peace out.